I'm Frank Cashin, the general manager of the New York Mets. And I'm Keith Hernandez, captain of the New York Mets. And this is At the Ballpark. It's a mystery. Fine drive, left center, well hit, Dykstra. Oh, boy, Dykstra and Wilson collide. We don't know whether the ball was caught or not. It's a comedy. Jackie Mowdy, he has his uniform on upside down with the shoes on the hand, and it looks like he's walking on his hand. <laughs> it's controversial. Tony Pena wants the bat that Howard Johnson used, and he's going to complain, I think, about pine tar being too far up. No, he's looking at the barrel of the bat, and they're confiscating the bat that Howard Johnson used. It's a tragedy. Well hit the center field. Mookie Wilson going back at the wall. It is gone. A home run for Terry Pendleton. And the ball game is tied in the ninth inning. It's a romance. And the fans still standing and screaming, waiting for the players to come out. No one is left. And here comes the ball club back out onto the field. It's excitement. the ballpark. A review of the 1987 New York Mets. With your host, General Manager Frank Cashin and Captain Keith Hernandez. The 87 baseball season is certainly now history and it was a uh, checkerboard history. Ups and downs, uh, a lot of uh, positives, a lot of negatives. Uh, I have to say at the outset, going into the season, I have never been more confident, never going into a season with higher expectations and I went into the 1987 season. Yes, Frank, it was a season of um, great expectations, uh, defending world champions, uh, the challenges there to repeat, uh, the acquisition of Kevin McReynolds to improve our ball club. Uh, I went into spring training with a very positive attitude, but as we'll see in the film, it was a season of a lot of uh, ups and downs that started in spring training. Yeah, there were some early warning signs. Uh, we lost Doc Gooden uh, in, in spring training, Roger McDowell, our best uh, relief pitcher, and arguably our best starting pitcher, and um, I guess the warning signs were there. And then comes the realism of the season, and we're off, and we go through an April where we're 11-9, and nine, and um, we were, uh, I think the only time we were ever in first place was after the, about the sixth game of the season, and after that, we never really got back to first place. But even though we finished that segment of the season slightly over 500, I have to tell you that maybe because of my early enthusiasm, I was still really hopeful. And as far as that early segment of the season, I can in good conscience say I'd give that a thumbs up. Well, Frank, I think here I'm going to have to disagree with you because I felt that we started uh, setting the tone for the season. and We made a lot of mental mistakes, I felt. Uh, not physical mistakes, because those happen. We made a lot of mental errors early in the year that set the tone for the following months and for our, our bad first half of the season. And for that reason, I'm going to have to give it a thumbs down. For the 1987 New York Mets, spring training began with high expectations. Just a few months before, Davy Johnson's team had won a world championship and now appeared capable of taking another. Not only were the Mets deep with returning veterans, they now had Kevin McReynolds, who had come from San Diego in an off-season trade. McReynolds gave the Mets what some considered the best lineup in baseball. But just before camp broke, so did the Mets' luck. Reliever Roger McDowell suffered from a hernia, which required an operation that would eventually keep him out of the lineup until mid-May. And if that wasn't bad enough, star pitcher Dwight Gooden entered a rehab clinic that would force him to miss the first two months of the year. So the Mets headed north, definitely without two top pitchers, and probably without the arrogance that they had been identified with in 1986. Still, on opening day 1987, 
Mets fans fill Shea Stadium, eager to see their team begin its defense of the previous year's World Championship. And now, the members of the 1986 World Champion New York Mets to receive their World Championship ring. This was indeed a proud moment for the players, the organization, and of course the fans, who had waited 17 long years to see a championship flag over Shea Stadium. As for the game, thanks to Daryl Strawberry, the Mets picked up right where they left off. Fly ball to right field, it's way back there. Going, going, and gone, goodbye. Three one home run by Daryl Strawberry, and the Mets lead him three to nothing. Strawberry's homer provided all the Mets runs, and thanks to Bob Ojeda and Jesse Orozco, it was all they would need. Ground ball to second, Jackman waiting to Hernandez, and the Mets win again on opening day. Unfortunately, 1987 would not be like 1986 when the Mets ran away from the pack early. This time, the team played under 500 until the end of May, and almost saw the season fade away before it really even began. Kind to left, and this ball is going to it hit a bird. You hit will a lay that. bird. I, I've never seen that. That's the first ew of the 1987 season. Swing a long one in the left field, way back in the corner, grand slam, and that's the winner. High block, couple. Steps on third, he goes to second, and now at first, not in time, the run scores. So Johnson went for the triple play, and the tying run scores. Boy, that is tough. And now Mookie's going to be walked intentionally. <laughs> oh, my Pick God. Off at second base. Barry line picked off on an intentional walk. That's a mess up right there, Ralph. That's what that is. For a time, nothing the Mets did seemed to go right, and it was epitomized by a play Roger McDowell made against the Padres on May 19. Off the glove of McDowell, kicks away. Can he make, oh, everybody's safe. How do you like that? And McDowell threw the ball away. Oh, what a crazy play. That play sort of symbolizes everything that happened today. Everything bad that could happen seemed to happen. Uh, as you'll see in this next segment coming up, Dwight Gooden gets back, but things really don't get that much better. I agree with you, Frank. Uh, May certainly was a month to forget about, uh, but there were some good things coming in the next segment. Tim Tuffle uh, carried us offensively, uh, kind of played the ball we all expected him to do, uh, to, to play. And uh, also... Terry Leach was our savior, and he won six ball games, I believe, in June uh, on his way to 10 in a row, and I'd hate to see where we would have finished if uh, we didn't have Terry Leach in there. But even with all those promising things, I'd have to give this next segment a really a thumbs down. Well, Frank, I'm going to have to agree with you. I have to give it a, a thumbs down because uh, we're 10 and a half games out of first place at the end of June, and that's a position you don't want to be in. On June 5th, however, the Mets and their fans finally found themselves in a position they wanted to be in. It was one of those memorable nights in New York, a night which saw one superhero give his heart to one person, while another gave his to 50,000 people. Dwight Gooden was back on the mound at Shea, and Mets fans were glad to see that despite his two-month absence, Dr. K seemed to be in mid-season form. And he's lucky now. Well, Gooden starts off with a bat. But on this night, Dwight wasn't the only one who provided a bang. Line drive, left center, well hit, Dykstra. Oh, boy, Dykstra and Wilson collide. Green's going to try to score, but it was an out. The ball was caught for the third out. Otherwise, it's an inside-the-park home run. Remarkably, neither Wilson nor Dykstra was seriously hurt on the play. And as a result of that amazing catch, the Mets stayed ahead of the Pirates. And when Gooden walked off the mound after pitching six and a third innings of one-run ball, Dwight had his long-awaited first win of the year. From there, Gooden went on to win five of his first six starts. 
rekindling a love affair between himself and Met fans that appeared to be just what the doctor ordered. Despite Gooden's return, the Mets still couldn't catch up to the leaders in the National League East, and the main reason was the sorry state of their pitching staff. Bob Ojeda was already lost for virtually the whole season with an injured elbow, and soon after, Rick Aguilera joined him on the disabled list, too. Then David Cohn suffered a broken pinky and was out until the middle of August. For a time, there seemed to be no escape from disaster. Sid Fernandez followed his Pitcher of the Month honors for April by injuring his knee in May. In a game against the Giants, Fernandez pitched no-hit ball for five innings, but had to leave in the sixth and would end up missing several starts. Even the healthy seemed cursed. Ron Darling went an incredible 14 starts without a win, including one game against the Phillies in June when he took a no-hitter into the bottom of the eighth. Wilson can't get there and the no-hitter is gone. Gross will have at least two. He's going for three as Wilson throws it in. It's a leadoff triple for Greg Gross. Darling not only lost his no-hitter, but his shutout too. And then in the ninth, the Mets lost the game. Fine drive to center. Mookie coming hard. Can't get it. The Phillies win. With their pitching staff in a virtual shambles, the Mets even tried dipping into their past until Tom Seaver aborted his comeback attempt and decided to hang his spikes up for good. The Mets, however, did find a savior in Terry Leach, who came out of the bullpen to excel as a starter. Ground ball a second, and that should do it. What a remarkable achievement for Terry Leach as he wins his seventh of the year. Leach went on to win his first ten games not only establishing a Met record, but also keeping the team within shouting range of the Cardinals. In fact, during the month of June, the Mets called on just about everyone in their lineup to pitch in during troubled times, like Lee Mazzilli, a valuable pinch hitter all year long, who drove in seven runs in a doubleheader in a rare starting role. Ripped down the right field line, base hit. Finds it's going to walk home. been getting big hits for the Mets all year long. Another steady performer throughout June was Rafael Santana, who not only excelled in the field, but also at the plate. Ground ball, base hit! One run score! The tie ball game! Two to two! But the real surprise of the first half of the season was second baseman Tim Tuffle who got hot early and never seemed to cool down. On the year, Tuffle hit 299 and tied a team record for a second baseman with 14 homers and 61 RBI. But what really caught the fans' attention was the Tuffle Shuffle, a little dance Tim did at the plate before every at-bat, which reminded some of another group that had played at Shea some 20 years earlier.
playing the tuffle shuffle. We uh, let uh, Timmy have the business for around a week with that when we played it every day in the clubhouse. But I really feel, Frank, that uh, this was the part that really started the season turning around for us. Tough old shuffle, I think, helped. Anything loosens up the clubhouse really helps. But as we'll see in this next segment, the All-Star break also helped. We were a different kind of ball club after the All-Star break. A lot of guys started to take off. We were just a different club. Uh, we went into St. Louis. We had to win three games. Uh, we did win three games. We definitely did. That was a crucial series, of course. Um, the West Coast trip was outstanding for us. Uh, Gary Carter, myself, Kevin McReynolds got hot all together. We were scoring runs. Ron Darling started pitching the ball we expected out of him. He turned his season around. And I just feel this, this part of the year right here, Frank, to me personally, is the best part of the season for us and a resounding thumbs up. I agree. The bats were getting so hot that people were starting to confiscate them. So I'd have to give this part <laughs> of the season also thumbs up. Two weeks after the All-Star break, the Mets still trailed the Cardinals by eight and one-half games. And when the teams met in St. Louis, the Mets were clearly in need of a sweep. Trailing 4-3 in the eighth inning of the first game, Tim Tuffle got them started. Ground ball off the middle base hit by Worrell. Wilson to third, Mazzilli scores, Mets lead it 5-4. Roger McDowell came on in relief of Ron Darling, and when McDowell was through, Darling had his fourth win in his last five games, and the Mets still had a glimmer of hope. Their 6-4 win had cut the Cardinals' lead to seven and one-half games, and the next night, they would inch even closer with Howard Johnson untying a game in the 10th. Well hit left center. This might make the seat. Home run Johnson. Six to four New York. Oh, baby. Disbelievers aside, Hojo had come through in a big way. And three outs later, the Mets had two. The next night, the sweep was complete but not before some good old-fashioned intrigue involving Howard Johnson's bat, which the Cardinals and some other teams felt was giving Hojo an unfair advantage. And this ball hit deep to right. It could be gone. It is going goodbye. Howard Johnson with a long home run, and the Mets lead it by a score of 5-3. to three. Whitey Herzog out of the dugout immediately, and Tony Pena wants the bat that Howard Johnson used. And he's going to complain, I think, about Pine Tar being too far up. No, he's looking at the barrel of the bat. And they're confiscating the bat that Howard Johnson used. This ball is deep to right. Going, going, gone. Goodbye. Wait a minute. What's happening here? I'm going to check the bat again. Oh, come on. This is his gamer. You can't be doing that to his gamer. They might have been able to take away Hojo's bat, but in 1987, there was no taking away his accomplishment. Here's Steve. Look at him go. And Howard Johnson does it again. All I do is try and go out every day and do the best I can. Howard Johnson, hey back, out of here. Oh, here's a little bundle of dynamite. One of the major surprises of this 1987 baseball season has been the play of Howard Johnson. Howard Johnson has gotten a lot of key hits. You talk about bringing smiles to the faces of his teammates. A little looper to center, and that's going to tie it. 3-3 three, three ball game. Johnson comes through. Well hit deep right field. Out of here. Howard Johnson, the Mets lead it 4-3. to three. And he joins a rather exclusive club. 30 home runs and 30 stolen bases. And they're standing all over this ballpark and applauding the season that Johnson has had. With Johnson leading the way, the Mets really made up some ground on the cards throughout the rest of the summer, sending a message which read that they were clearly back in the race. Everyone got hot. Kevin McReynolds kept on a 29 homer, 95 RBI pace with summer hitting streaks of 13 and 14 straight games to go along with his exceptional fielding in left. McReynolds to the wall. He makes the Nice play by Nick Reynolds. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. McReynolds makes the play. Keith Hernandez, of course, made his share of plays, too, capturing another Gold Glove Award in 1987. They hold the runner up there. Now he's going to try to score the throw. He is out! Oh, it's a play! 
Hernandez got closer to his bat during the summer, at one point hitting in a career-high 17 straight games on his way towards batting 290 for the year with 13 game-winning hits. Almost got it, or did he? Way back right field. Home run, Keith Hernandez. The Mets win it 3-2. Oh, baby. Once again in 1987, Gary Carter was a player to be looked up to. And his solid play behind the plate took much of the sting out of his subpar season at the plate. Line to center, base hit. Pena's going to try to score and will. One to one. No! He's out! What a play by Carter! The Mets' strength up the middle continued with Mookie Wilson as one half of the team's versatile center field platoon. As the summer heated up, so did Mookie, who finished the season with a 299 average. The other half of the duo was the dynamic Lenny Dykstra, who stole 27 bases on the year and ignited the Mets with both his speed and his reckless abandon. Dykstra's back. What an incredible catch. Dykstra got a good job. Made the catch. Oh, boy. Dykstra's play was just part of the fun that engulfed Shea throughout the summer of 87. As the Mets grew closer to first, more and more fans came to Queens not only to see baseball like it ought to be, but also to have some fun while they were there. On August 28th, the Mets left New York and headed for the West Coast, still trailing the Cardinals by four and a half games. Up ahead, three games each in San Francisco, San Diego, and then to finish the trip, Los Angeles. And the Mets needed to make headlines. Howard Jackson, number 33 on the year. The Mets are out in front of the Padres here in the top of the 10th, six to five. What a comeback. McReynolds makes the play. What a play by Kevin McReynolds. Wow. Dwight Gooden wins his 13th game of the year. And the Mets sweep the Padres. It's Gary Carter's 11th grand slam home run. And that leads all active players. Speaking of active players, it was nice to see Rick Aguilera back and pitching effectively. Aggie had returned to the active list on August 24th and won his first three starts, including two on the coast. The Mets then closed out the trip by winning seven of the nine games. The Mets have now won six games in a row. They are now just two and a half games behind the St. Louis Cardinals in the National League's Eastern Division. Frank, that's more like it. Great West Coast trip, a uh, trip we had to have coming home, a big important homestand, the Cardinals coming in. I agree. That was certainly Met baseball like baseball ought to be. And um, we had the Cardinals coming in. We had that unfortunate series. I think the really low point of the season when Pendleton hit that home run in the ninth inning with two outs, two strikes, a man on base to tie the score. We were destined to lose that game. And, of course, we lost again the next day. Yeah, I can remember that uh, moment like it happened yesterday. Uh, that was just like, uh, just shot, shot you down from the sky. It was like if the game had gone 17 innings, we were going to lose. It was just, I think, the, the point that, the, that point just turned our season around, took the wind right out of our sails. And as we'll see in the next segment, we still have a month left. We still have a chance to win it. Uh, we really don't play good baseball. The exception to that would be Daryl Strawberry. Yeah, Daryl came through and played the type of ball we've always expected from him. Um, player of the month. He carried us in, in, in September. Um, I didn't have a particularly good month, and Daryl picked up the slack and really carried our ball club. Well, we'll have to give a salute to Daryl Strawberry, but as far as the rest of the ball club and the entire ball club's concerned, I have to rate this next segment really thumbs down. 
Well, I have to agree to hear Frank because uh, we just, after that series with St. Louis, we won one, lost one, won one, lost one, and you know, you got to have a better September than that to win a pennant. And I have to agree with you. Thumbs down. The National League East flag was on the line when Whitey Herzog's Cardinals came to town just a game and a half ahead of the Mets. The Cards had no intention of saying goodbye to first place, but the Mets had other ideas, especially when they jumped out to a 3-0 first inning lead thanks to a Daryl Strawberry home run. Most of the game, the Mets' early lead held up. The main reason for that? A rejuvenated Ron Darling, who had won 10 of his last 12 and was well on his way towards 11 of 13. On this night, it was like 1986 all over again as the Mets played the kind of ball which last year led them to a championship. Fastball by. But in the sixth inning, things began to unravel. Up to that point, Darling had a no-hitter. But that and the rest of his season went down the drain when Darling tore ligaments in his thumb trying to feel the Vince Coleman bunt. Still, the Mets had a 4-2 lead with two outs in the ninth. Then, disaster struck. The Mets fans looking for the final out of the ball game that will move their ball club to within one half game of St. Louis. But that one out never came. The Cardinals went on to win the game in the 10th, 6-4, to four, and from then on, the Mets never really recovered. But there was still almost a month of baseball left to read about, and some of it was downright historic. Darryl Strawberry went on to steal his 30th base, and in the process joined Howard Johnson in the 30-30 club, the only teammate ever to do so. Strawberry also finished the season with a 284 average to go along with 39 homers and 104 RBI. Clearly, someday 1987 will be best remembered as the year Darryl truly hit the big time. Despite Strawberry's heroics, the Mets were relegated to watching the scoreboard after the disastrous Cardinals series, and the frustrating thing about it was that the Cardinals kept the door wide open. But no matter how hard they tried, the Mets could not catch the cards. The Mets now have just about lost all the hope that they could ever possibly have, so the curtain is closing on the New York Mets. Have 
clinched a tie in the National League East. That tie soon became the pennant as the 1987 Mets disappeared from the Eastern Division race. Even in the end, there were bright spots and glimpses of what will be in 1988. For instance, Randy Myers, who matured tremendously late in the year while winning three games and saving six, is now ready to take over as the Mets' left-handed closer in the bullpen. David Cohn, who won five times in his dual role as a starter and reliever, despite missing nearly three months with a broken finger. Cohn should continue in that role in 88, and will likely be a valuable asset to Davey Johnson's pitching staff. Another of the Mets' young stars who could shine in 88 is second baseman Keith Miller, who hit 373 in the 25 games he played in 1987. Then, too, there's Kevin Elster who hit 310 at Tidewater and should be the Mets' shortstop when the 88 season begins. Well, there it is, the 1987 season. And as you said right in the beginning, it was a season of ups and downs. But after looking at that last segment and seeing all those great young ball players, I kind of get excited about 1988. But we're here. We still have a duty to review the 87 season. And I have to say that uh, one of the great thrills I got out of the 87 season was drawing a record-setting three million plus into New York, uh, into Shea Stadium. First time any team really, uh, outside of the California teams, ever drew that many people. So I certainly have to give a thumbs up to the people of New York. Definitely, Frank. They at are the same positive. time, looking at it myself, uh, maybe because I'm so dedicated to winning, and maybe because I was so enthusiastic. Overall, the little bit, the end of the season was a little bit of a bummer for me. So. I'm going to have to give it a kind of tentative, but still, the season a thumbs down. Well, Frank, I think you're being a little bit hard on yourself. I know you're dedicated to winning, but I do feel that uh, with the season that we had, the injuries, or the turmoil we had, uh, losing five of our starters, all five of our starters at one time of the season or other, or sometimes three at a time, to win 92 ball games, uh, 10 games out at the All-Star break, uh, any team could have laid down and died. We showed a lot of character, I felt to come back and make a, a race out of it and really fall out of it the last four days of the season. So for that reason, I'm going to have to give the season as a whole a definite thumbs up. The Mets might not have won the World Series in 1987, but they did win 92 games and along the way provided plenty of excitement for their fans. All 3.027 million of them. <laughs> 